and welcome back to Kidman Talk. I am your host, Carl Bastian, coming to you from Kidology.org. Welcome to episode 144. Got a great topic for you today. Today, we are talking about when the leadership over you is hindering the ministry. That's right. Sometimes you feel like the biggest obstacle in your ministry is the leadership that you are working under. And we're going to unpack that today and talk about ways you can lead up as well as leading forward. Today is sponsored by ServeHQ.Church, one of the best online tools that can help your ministry advance forward and equip and encourage the volunteers who are serving with you in your ministry. Welcome to those of you who are joining me from the Kidmin Megacon Conference. Glad to have you here on the podcast here today. And thank you to everybody who sends me notes of encouragement, questions, and feedback from the podcast. It's always very much appreciated. And yes, the beard has been shaved off. I'm done with that. It was a lot of fun uh, hangover from my backpacking trip, but it's time to get back to it. So let's talk Kidman here on Kidman Talk. Hey, I'm so uh, blessed and thankful every time I get to spend some time with you here on Kidman Talk. Today was the beginning of the uh, Kidman Megacon. I'm doing five sessions this week as part of uh, that conference. And today I kicked it off with a workshop that I really enjoyed um, putting together. It's one that I've never done before. And I decided to go ahead and, and do it again here on the podcast so that uh, my podcast listeners um, can also enjoy this topic because it's one I think is really critical. And we're going to talk about um, how to lead when you feel like the leadership that you are serving under is hindering your ability to advance the children's ministry. Let me just read to you the description of this workshop and what we're going to talk about today. Far too often, children's ministry leaders find or feel that the biggest obstacle to their success is the leadership above them. Common complaints are lack of support, lack of funding, lack of interest, lack of understanding of the value of children's ministry. Now, we know that kids' ministry is critical to the growth of the entire church, but how do you get the senior leadership to see the value and to support it in ways that make a difference? Well, I want to talk to you today about some changes in your thinking that will help, but also some real practical suggestions that will help you advance the ministry and help change the mindset of the leaders that you are responsible to, that you serve under, and that hold the purse strings and um, and the keys to a lot of the things you need in order to be successful in ministry. But first, let me just tell you quickly about one of our sponsors here. We're very thankful to those that help support Kidology from our vendors to our sponsors to you, those of you who support the ministry with your membership. It gives you full access to the entire uh, database and vault of all the resources on Kidology. Today's show is sponsored by ServeHQ.Church. And ServeHQ is a wonderful resource for training and communicating and following up with your volunteers. They've got three tools that all work integrated together. They're called Huddle Up, Trained Up, and Follow Up. The Huddle Up tool is for mass email and texting, plus safe uh, group chat for everyone in your ministry. Trained Up is where you can offer online classes for new members, new volunteers, and for developing your leaders. You can know that they watch the videos, you can ask questions, and you can walk them through a process of making sure that they have watched the videos and have the information they need to be successful in whatever realm of the ministry that they are a part of. And then new to ServeHQ is their follow-up tool. This is where you can automate the next steps for new volunteers, for new guests, for new members, and so much more. So please go to kidology.org forward slash ServeHQ because there you're going to find a link 
that is exclusive to our members. When you log in there, you're going to get a discount code where you can try out ServeHQ for an exclusive discount. You can also go straight to ServeHQ.Church, learn more about um, all the services. Their, their customer support is fantastic, answering questions you might have, signing up for a, a trial uh, of their services, and you're going to find it very beneficial to your ministry. So do check out Huddle Up, Trained Up, Follow Up. You can use all of them. You can use the one that meets the needs that you have currently in your ministry, but they're designed to integrate and to work together. All right, let's unpack this topic of how do we lead when we feel like um, there is some obstacles, um, some hindrances to what we want to do, and those obstacles actually come from um, the leadership ab above us. But the, the first thing I want to do is I want to um, push back a little bit against that. We're going to get into some very practical things you can do, but, but I want to speak to you from a place of someone who has been there. Let me tell you, I have had bosses across the spectrum. I have had the micromanaging boss who I wondered, why do you even need me? You're giving me things to do, but then you're spelling out literally down to the brand and the ounce size cups that I'm to buy. You know, I'm really just an errand boy because you're not letting me make any decisions. I've had the boss who was distant and removed and seemed to not even care about the children's ministry. And you might think, you know, that extreme is wonderful because you can do whatever you want. And yet there's downsides to that. I've had bosses that were wonderful mentors and coaches, and I learned a lot under them. I've had bosses that, that were very um, clueless, that knew nothing about children's ministry and and had requests and requirements that were actually, you know, contradictory or or detrimental to the to the ministry. And I've had bosses that were incredibly supportive and championed the children's ministry. And so I've had um, these bosses across the board, and uh, some have been very challenging. Some have been very uh, rewarding, but. Anytime we point the finger at someone else, we have to remember the old saying, right? If you're pointing a finger away, there's a couple of fingers pointing back. So um, anytime we criticize someone else, we have to remember that there's two sides to every coin, right? You know the old saying that um, if, if the, the headlights of the oncoming car are always appear brighter than your own. That's right. I mean, you know, we can see the faults of others. And we sometimes are blind to the faults of our own. Because as I look back over years of ministry, you know, I, I've had all kinds of bosses. And it's very easy for me to identify what I think are their flaws, or their faults. I had one that, man, downright, I think the guy, I, like, was even a Christian, right? It was, it was so bad. And yet I have to be objective enough, as Scripture says, to consider yourself with sober judgment. Um, because they had to work with a children's pastor who... Uh, years ago was perhaps immature. Um, I've had bosses that have had to work with a children's pastor who was very disorganized, um, with children's pastor who was impulsive, who would have one idea and then and he wouldn't even finish it and he'd be on to the next idea, um, who was distracted. I've had to, you know, my bosses have had to deal with a children's pastor who was messy, right? He'd go through the children's ministry wing and see stuff everywhere. And so while it's easy to say what I've had to deal with, I've got to have enough grace and forgiveness to realize yeah, they've had to deal with some things with me too. So as much grace as I want to receive for the mistakes or the immaturity or the lack of knowledge um, that I have had in doing my job, um, as, as much as, you know, remember, don't judge unless you want to be judged. I've got to be willing to give the same grace that I want to receive. So keep that in mind. You know, in, in my role with Kidology, I, I've gotten to talk and chat with many children's pastors, and, and I hear the laments about um, the leaders above them. And I've heard some horror stories. I've heard stories that break my heart. I've heard stories that make me downright angry. And I, I understand I'm, I'm hearing half the story, and there's times I, I wish I could hear the, the lead pastor's uh, version of events. Um, but I often hear how the leadership just doesn't care, doesn't prioritize children. And, and often I'll, I'll kind of gently ask, well, what is your role? What, what is your position in the children's ministry? 
And they'll often say, well, I'm the children's pastor. And, and more times than not, I'll, I'll ask, is, is it a paid position? And, and they'll say, yeah, I'm paid. And some days it's part-time. Not always. Um, but I'll say, well, so they at least value kids enough to, to have that position and, and sometimes even to pay that position. So sometimes we have to realize that the kind of support we want to have, it may look different than we want. And the fact that, that, that you're there means there is a level of support because there could be nobody there. They, they could just have nobody. They could have no staff position. And so just the fact that you are there is important. We have to make sure that our expectation of the leadership above us is realistic. You know, there's an old saying, you know, don't criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. You know why that is, because you don't criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes, because that way, if, if he doesn't like what you have to say, well, you'll be a mile away and you'll have his shoes. <laughs> but when we think about the leadership above us, we have to understand that while kids' ministry is the world to us, in reality, it is just a portion of the ministry to our to our lead pastor. You know, he's overseeing the kids and the youth and men's ministry and women's ministry and outreach ministry and small group ministry and perhaps an educational ministry. He's also overseeing um, the leadership, whether it's deacons or church board and, and budgets and facility and, and finances. Well, that's budget, but there's all kinds of things that a lead pastor's overlooking, and and I'm with you. I mean, we can argue the uh, importance and the priority of children's ministry, and believe me, I'm with you on that. And yet, from a lead pastor's point of view, it's not always going to be as important to him as it is to us. And there's a part of it where it's okay, because it's our job to fulfill that role, to be that that champion and that supporter of the children's ministry. So let's talk about um, how to move forward when you're having those things. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is actually the last resort. Um, it's it's the least important thing. But I want to talk about it first because I don't want to end there. Um, because often your last argument or the last thing you talk about is the thing people uh, stick with or go with. Because I want to start by talking about when should you leave. Because when you get discouraged, when you get upset, when you get down, you can't help thinking about, maybe I just need to throw in a towel. Maybe I just need to leave. And there is a time for that. But I don't want to end with that because I don't want you to, to end there. Because there's some very positive things you can do to help change and uh, push forward the mindset of the leadership that you are serving under the authority of. So when should you leave a ministry? Let me give you three reasons why you may legitimately leave a ministry. The first one, number one, is if a ministry is taking you away from your calling, it may be time to leave. Now, I don't mean temporarily, like during this COVID season, you may be doing things that are not part of your calling. It, there may be a temporary side trail as the team rallies to just keep the doors open and do ministry and to do them in a creative season. But I mean, you may be find yourself in a situation where your job description's changing, where the expectations are changing, and you're being taken away from what God has called you and equipped you to do. And if you're finding that what you're being expected and asked to do is contrary to what God has gifted and called you to do, then sometimes leaving is something you need to pray about. And this is really hard because often the church you're at is maybe it's your first ministry. Maybe it's the church that actually gave you an opportunity to serve God and to pursue a calling in children's ministry. Of course, you know, if it's talking about leaving a community that you love or a home that you love, and of course, volunteers you enjoy, and absolutely, of course, the kids that you're attached to and, and that you love, it's very hard to think about that. But you got to realize your calling is not to a church. Your calling is to the Lord, and your calling is to a mission. And if a church starts to lead you away from your calling, it may be time to get on your knees and to pray and to say, God, is this where I can fulfill my gift, my calling, and is this where I can best 
use my gifts? And it may be, and only you can answer this question with advisors and with your family, your spouse, is this where I can fulfill my calling? You know, I was at one church where things were going really great. Um, the kids' ministry was growing. I was having a great time, but the leadership above me changed. And the new executive pastor that I was serving under, not a bad guy, and he was doing what he was called to do, but he began to change my job description. He didn't want me teaching. He wanted me just recruiting and training other teachers. He didn't want me having a kid's crew um, because he didn't want me to be that far in the trenches. He wanted me to walk around. And he literally said, be a boss man on Sundays. And I, I had a, a staff at this church that, that could walk around and supervise on Sundays. And, I, and, and I'm not being critical of him. I understood what he was trying to do to prepare the church for growth. But more and more, I began to realize that while I love that church and I love the people and I certainly love the kids, that I was getting out of my gift zone. I was getting out of my passion and my joy zone. I was going to be miserable there. He was not going to be happy. And, and I had to make the difficult decision to leave that ministry. And when you leave, you take the high road. You don't criticize that leader. You don't criticize the church. Often it's going to confuse people. But I had to come to the conclusion that that church job in the sense it's a job not just a ministry no longer fit my ministry calling and it was hard to do so number one if a ministry is taking you away from your calling it may be time to leave and to ask god where he wants to move you to where you can fulfill your calling number two this one's even more serious if you can't support the direction or the integrity of the leadership you may find yourself in a situation where you philosophically do not agree with the direction of the church, or you may have some serious issues with the integrity of the leadership. A long time ago, I was in a church where small staff behind the scenes, I saw the way the pastor was making decisions, saw the way he would get rid of people he didn't like, I saw the way he was managing finances. And there's an old saying, you know, when if you're not the lead pastor, you are hitching your train car to an engine and you have to be comfortable with the direction of that engine's going and how that engine's operating because you are you are linking yourself to that engine. And my wife and I began to get more and more uncomfortable. And when I even suggested disconnecting, going somewhere else, that engine got very upset with me. And that was even more confirming that I could no longer be attached to that person. And even though there were some integrity issues that I had concerns with, as a young man, I didn't feel it was my job to take down or criticize the pastor. I had to work really hard to just talk about the positive reasons for where I was going as God opened another door to ministry and did not say anything negative about the pastor. I let that train derail on its own as it did uh, down the road. And then people eventually came back and said, now we see, now we understand. And even some people who were angry at me for leaving came back and asked for forgiveness because in hindsight, they saw that I took the high road and I detached myself from a situation that was not going in a good direction. You know, sometimes the church is taking you away from your calling, but sometimes you realize, man, I cannot support the direction or the integrity of this church. But the third one is probably the hardest. And the third reason for leaving a ministry, and it's very subjective, nobody can tell you this reason. You have to arrive at this on your own, in prayer, passionate prayer on your knees. And number three is if that ministry is hurting your family or your soul, all right? You may find yourself in a situation where there's not an integrity issue. There's not a ministry situation. The conflict may not be moral in issue. It may be just philosophical, maybe just personality, but it is sucking the joy out of your ministry. And my wife and I were once in a ministry situation where we found that every meal we were just talking about the, the negativity and the things we didn't like, and, and we just were not happy. And, and it just got to be unhealthy for us. And it reached a point where I finally said to my wife, as the leader of this family, a year from now, we will be somewhere else. I didn't know where. I didn't know how. I said, all I know is I'm the leader of this family. This is not a healthy situation. I will 
get us somewhere healthy with God's help. If he wants us here, then he's going to close all doors, but we're, we're going to get somewhere else. And we ended up doing that. And it took, it took that full year for God to do a work in us and a work in our circumstance to get out of that unhealthy situation. To this day, my wife is thankful for my leadership in that situation because sometimes you, you have to realize that your family comes first, your marriage comes first, your soul comes first, and you have to prioritize that. You know, you have to understand that God is more interested in building you and building your character than he is in building a church. And if something's hindering that, you've got to get away. But let me also give you some reasons why you don't leave, all right? You don't leave just because it's hard. All right? You don't leave because it's challenging. You don't leave because it's discouraging. You never leave quickly. Never just throw in your res your um, your resignation or throw your keys down. Never quit something while you're emotional. You know, my dad used to say you can always postpone a bad decision. I mean, you're if you're angry, you're mad, you're hurt, and you just want to quit, man, just 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 stop. Just calm down. Give yourself a day, a week. Or just say, you know, I'm going to pray about this for a month. I'm going to maintain. I'm going to keep serving God. I'm going to let my emotions go down um, and give God a chance uh, to work on me. Because remember, God is trying to, to do a work in you. And you know what? We don't grow outside of difficult situations. If everything's easy, we don't grow. So we need those problems in our life. Difficult ministries grow us. Um, they, they, they grow our character. And so while that ministry may be difficult, God may be trying to do something in you through those difficult uh, situations. You know, Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good because in the proper time, we will be rewarded if we do not give up. So you've got to endure through those hard times. Remember, the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. And when we look at that job description on that job website, or we look at this other church that's hiring, we look at their website, it all looks so wonderful. There, there's problems everywhere. You've probably heard it said, you know, if you're looking for the perfect church, don't join it uh, when you find it because you'll ruin it as soon as you join it because you're not perfect, all right? Because some of the issues you may take with you, all right? If, if sometimes the issues that you're struggling with they're not about the leadership. They're not about the church. They're, they're issues with you. And that's hard. You know, I, I, I've, I've known some leaders that have gone from ministry to ministry to ministry, and I've heard their complaints about every ministry. And it's been hard for me because I hear the same issue in every ministry. And there's a part of me that wants to say, brother, sister, I'm hearing the same thing in every church. And I'm starting to wonder if the common denominator is not the church, it's you. So we've got to make sure that we learn what we need to learn in that tough situation before we move on. Because otherwise, you, you'll, you'll take your problems with you. It's like those who get divorced and remarry and their chances of getting divorced again are greater each time they remarry because they take their problems with them. And it doesn't mean there weren't issues on the other side. It's just that until you resolve what's your fault, whether it's 50-50 or whether it's 20% or 5%, you take those flaws with you. So you've got to make sure you work on you before you just run to a new ministry. And trust that God will open a door for you if he wants you to go somewhere else. You begin to you know, uh, set up the resume, start putting feelers out, praying. Most of the time, God will open up a door for you. And that's his way of saying, I've got something new for you, all right? That way you're going to something as opposed to running from something. Now, I'm not saying that always happens. There was one time where I needed to leave out of conviction, and I went to unemployed status. I had to make that decision. Part of that was to get out of that unhealthy situation, and part of it was uh, that was what was best for the church um, so that the tension didn't continue, and it was very scary. Um, but I trusted God, and then God answered prayer, and I ended up in a new ministry that was wonderful and healthy, and and I, and I would not have been available for that had I not taken that step of faith. It, it's different for everyone, but listen to God and trust God, all right? So there are times to leave. If the ministry is taking you away from your calling, you can't support the direction or the integrity of the leadership you're under, um, or it is really harming your soul, your walk with God, or 
um, your family, but don't just bail, all right? So you're going to stay. So for the rest of this podcast, we're going to talk about what do you do when you're determined to stay. You know that's where God wants you, but you're discouraged or you're frustrated and you want to make it better. So I want to give you three very practical things that you can do to lead up and to advance the ministry, all right? Number one is you've got to support the leadership above you. Sometimes we are frustrated about what we cannot get from the ministry. To invoke a political famous quote, ask not what the leadership can do for you, but what you can do for the leadership. You've got to remember that you are part of a team. So you got to act like you're a team member. Now, I get it. I'm with you. Children's ministry is the most important ministry of the church. Do I hear an amen? Amen, right? We get it, right? we got to reach people when they're young. I get the stats of the likeliness of someone living for Christ if they're reached as a kid. I get that kids are the most effective way to grow a church. I get all of that. But remember, I'm supposed to get that. I'm a kid's pastor. You're supposed to get that. Everyone else doesn't get that. And it's okay if they don't get that because your leadership, they're over every ministry. And every ministry is the most important. Suppose you're playing on a baseball team, right? Now, if you're a batter and that's what you're good at, you're going to think the batter's the most important player because the the batter, that's how you get points. You don't good batters. Doesn't matter what else, you're not going to win if you don't ever hit the ball, right? And what about the pitcher? The pitcher's the most important because, man, if, if you if you can't strike people out, if, if you can't pitch good and you pitch too easy, you're going to lose the game because the other team's going to get all kinds of points. And, man, first baseman, that that you got to have a good first baseman. Right? If he can't catch the ball or throw the ball, second base, that's the middle, man. That's where most of the balls go. Shortstop might say he's the most important because that's the number one get outfield. He could certainly argue that one of the outfielders is the most important catcher, right? I mean, every position could argue that they are the single most important. And I don't know enough about baseball to know who's right, but I think the answer is they're all right. And that's my point. You've got to be a team player. You play a position on the team. And so you've got to be a team player. And you've got to celebrate wins for the whole team. And you've got to be willing to help the whole team. So have a team mindset and you will find that when it comes time for your position to be celebrated or helped, you're going to get more help than if you're always just asking for help. Secondly, foster a relationship with your boss, all right? Here's a little secret. People help their friends out. If you're friends with your boss, your boss is going to want you to succeed and he's going to help you. If you're just an employee who's always asking for stuff, you're going to become an irritant. And there's not going to be this desire on your boss's um, side to want to help you and equip you and see you succeed if every time he sees you coming, he's like ducking or pretending he has a phone call because every the only time he ever hears from you is when he's asking for something, all right? You have to realize that part of your job is not to get out of him what you need so that you can look good and succeed. You're there to help him succeed. You're on his team. He's not on your team. Your job is to help him succeed. You know, in my present ministry, my lead pastor um, was the youth pastor. Now, he came from being a lead pastor um, in a professional sense. He took a step down to come here. He really felt God's calling, and he became the youth pastor. And then when our lead pastor left um, through a, a process, he became the lead pastor. But he, he continued to do youth ministry. And, um, you know, and I'm watching this, I'm thinking, man, he's doing youth, but he's, he's the lead pastor. So I finally went to him and I'm like, Caleb, you're still doing youth. Would you like me to do youth? And he said, I'd love if you did youth. I didn't want to ask you because you, you're doing kids and you're doing a great job and I didn't want to put more on your plate. And I said, dude, you're the lead pastor. Let me take youth on. And it was a big, it was a big thing. It was more time. It was more energy. It was another whole team to lead. I enjoyed it. Um, and, and he was very thankful. And I did that for about six months. And now we have a fantastic new uh, youth pastor. And I was able to relinquish that. It was actually a little sad when I gave it up. I really enjoyed those teenagers. But I also enjoyed going back to focusing just on kids. Um, but, but that gave me some credibility because that was, that was putting his best above what was best for me and, and wanting to serve him and release him uh, from something that he was willing to do. And, 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 and it, was, it was me serving him. 
And that, that gained me um, some credibility. So you want to be serving your pastor and asking, how can you serve your pastor? If your pastor's got kids, bless your pastor's kids. Do things for your kids. Find ways to, to serve them. You know, when, when my boss's kids come in the office, they usually go out with balloon animals. I mean, I, I stop what I'm doing. In fact, his oldest boy's got a candy jug of M&Ms in my office, always comes in. Micah gets his M&Ms. You know, and it's not that you're being manipulative. It's not that you're being a friend to your boss so you can get stuff from him. Yeah, what I'm saying is that you're genuinely caring about your boss. And one of the benefits is that he's going to care about your ministry. Friends help friends, all right? And it's so important. You want to ask what you can do to help. Givers get, askers don't, all right? You want to be generous and show that you care about the whole ministry. I was in one ministry years ago where every ministry was doing fall kickoffs, and it was actually becoming kind of contentious because the kids' ministry did a fall kickoff, the youth did, the worship did, everybody did. And so we were fighting over volunteers. And, and sometimes, you know, I'd be mad because one of my key volunteers wouldn't come to my kickoff because he's at the worship kickoff. And I'm like, how would you go to the worship kickoff and not my kickoff? And then someone else would be annoyed because their volunteer came to my kickoff. And so it was almost like a competition who could have the biggest kickoff because we're trying to get people to come to our big fall kickoff. And I, I went to my boss and I pulled him aside in privately and I said, we, we have a problem here. Everyone's doing these kickoffs. They're all great. They're all important. They're momentum starters and they're encouraging and they're training. And I said, I think we need to have one kickoff for the whole church. But I said, if I bring this idea to staff meeting, it's going to be the kids pastor's idea. No one's going to like it. But I said, I think, I think it needs to be your idea. And I pitched uh, a way to do it. And then he built on it. He came to the staff and said, I think we need to have a ministry fair. And then we brainstormed one year. It was a mini golf theme. Everyone made mini golf holes. And other year we did another thing. And everyone got on board and it solved the problem. And privately, he told me he was so thankful because he'd been wrestling with how to solve that. And he, he appreciated that. Now, the kids ministry benefited from that. But, but it solved a bigger problem than just the kids ministry trying to get all my people to come to my fall kickoff. So be a problem solver. Be the one with suggestions and solutions. You know, I had a problem years ago where, you know, rooms were getting double booked and I came up with, with my wife, I should give her some credit, with a room request form. We, we were sloppy about it. And I came privately and said, hey, I've created this form. And I think if every ministry went through this process to select rooms, he loved it. This was before computers. So it was triplicate form and tear off and everything. And it got implemented. It solved my problem, but it solved other people's problems. In fact, when computers were kind of new, Palm Pilot era, um, I helped introduce the first computer calendar for church-wide calendar coordination, right? Um, because it was all done on a paper calendar with the church secretary, and it was kind of a race to see who could get there first. And I said, we need a process and uh, communication and everything. And and those kind of things are valuable. In fact, one of my bosses um, gave me a quote that I could use on my resume in the future, and he said, Carl raised the bar for the entire ministry. Now, I don't share that as, as a bragging way because if you know kids pastors and if you know me, you know kids pastors are visionaries, they're creatives, they're messy, they're forgetful. I've had to learn organization and skill. And, and so that quote from my boss meant so much because it meant I had to work hard at it, but he noticed and it did. It raised the whole bar of the children's ministry. And when you take your A game and you help the whole ministry succeed, then when you need something, you have earned the right to be heard. Hey, you all know 1 Timothy 4.12, right? Let no one look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers. Well, I'd like to retranslate that if I don't get struck by lightning here. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're the children's ministry. Instead, set an example for the leadership in planning, organization, outreach, stewardship, and effectiveness, all right? Set the example. Be the ministry that cleans up after events, that has organized closets. Oh, I think I've got a closet I need to reorganize. But when you set the bar, when you set the example, 
You earn credibility that gains you the respect of the leadership above you, and then you're going to earn the right to be heard. So support the leadership above you. Have their perspective. Know that they're going to see the ministry different. Just don't always go asking for stuff. You know, here's a real practical thing. When you ask for things, be prepared for a no. Have your plan B. In fact, one of the things I love to do is I go with three levels of an ask. All right, plan A is what you want. Like, it's the big ask. It's like, man, here's what I would love to do, man, but it would it, cost a lot. It would be huge, you know, and it's the big budget. It's the all out, pull out all the stops, the huge ask, right? And then, and then add uh, the plan B, which would be, okay, I, I know that's, we probably don't have the money for that, but, but this, this would still be amazing. Um, it costs half as much, but it would still be really cool. Da, 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 da. And then say, but here's plan C. And, and at a minimum, the least expensive, it would still be good. Uh, here's plan C. Now, what's going to happen is you're showing that, you're showing your vision, you're showing your dream, you're showing you, you're, you're willing to play ball, you understand church limitations, resources, you understand everyone's asking him for stuff. Um, most of the time, you're going to get B. Now, if you just ask for B, you might get a no. If you ask for you know plan A, you're probably going to get a no. Or what happens is you get a lot of plan C's and, and, you, and you, you receive that with grace and they realize, man, you, you, keep, you want these A's and you keep being cool with C's, eventually you're going to get a B. Or, or you get a lot of plan C's, one, one of the A's are going to give you. Um, I was in one ministry where I went to my boss and I told him all about Josh Denhart, the amazing chemistry guy. And I said, man, he's got this chemistry show. In fact, he even has this family experience where the whole lobby's filled with chemistry experience. He even can go into the public school. And I said, man, plan A, I would love to just totally bless our schools and bring him in and pay for the school to get it. And then, and then, uh, but I said, but you know, obviously that's crazy. Um, I'd love to plan B. I'd love to do the family experience and the chemistry show, but like, I know that that's kind of expensive. At a minimum, I'd like to bring him in and do the amazing chemistry show. Well, you're not going to believe this. My boss told me, he says, Carl, I have had a fund that I have been putting money in for years, saving up for a community outreach. We're going to do the big one. And we did it. There's a video. I'll link it in the show notes. We brought Josh Denhart in. We did the family experience. We did the chemistry show. We paid to put him in our elementary school and to totally do the entire Josh Denhart experience. And the title of that YouTube video is Best Evangelistic Outreach in 16 Years. My boss loved it, all right? But there were things that led up to him um, believing in me and, and wanting to do it. And, and, and if I had just asked for the minimum, he would have given me the minimum. But I asked him for the big, and I got the big ask. You're not, you're not always going to get it. But if you don't ask, you won't receive. Isn't that what Jesus said? You receive not because you ask not, all right? So be willing to ask for those three levels, all right? And also be open to other ideas. You know, right now, because of COVID, we're not doing our trunk or treat. We normally do a big, amazing trunk or treat. We've done it for years. Thousands of people come on our property, and we get the fire department and the police and bounce houses and all the trunks. And, and I ride around my unicycle, and we do a petting zoo and a tr barrel train rides. I mean, it's the whole nine yards. And we couldn't do it this year. And so my idea was, well, if we can't reach people coming to our church, maybe we can reach the people who come to our people's houses. And so I got this idea for a DVD that had samples of our online kids' church and some different things. I took it to my boss, and I said, hey, this is what it would cost, and maybe we get a 1,000 of these made, and we give them out to our people. And, and he's like, Carl, I don't even have a DVD player in my house. And uh, he's like, if we're going to reach millennial families. They don't even know what a DVD player is. I'm like, oh, that's true. I'm dating myself. I said, well, what do you think we should do? He said, I think if we custom did an activity booklet, that way the kids get something immediately that they can color in and do. Do you think you can make that happen? I've uh, put a, a out there on Facebook. I'm looking for an artist. It's being made right now. I'm hoping to put it on Kidology, maybe even in time that, that you can uh, get the plans and, and get them printed and customized for your church as well. Um, but just being willing to ask for his input and to change my plans um, for his input um, that's how you get support, all right? Always, 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 always start 
with questions, all right? Learners always go further than know-it-alls, all right? Come in with questions. Even if you think you have it all figured out, come in and say, hey, what, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm, I'm wrestling with how to reach uh, this or, I'm, or how to do this. And start with questions, and then they'll reciprocate with, well, what are you thinking? Say, well, I, I've got this idea. I'm, I'm bouncing around. Because you've engaged them in the process. You've honored their wisdom, their experience, and their knowledge, and their authority, and their position. Help their vision come true through your vision, and you'll have their support. Because remember, you're on their team. You Let me say it again. You are on your pastor's team. He is not on your team. And so often I hear children's pastors talking like, man, I can't get my pastor to help me. Well, it's not his job to help you. All right? It's great when he helps you. Your job is to help him. So what you have to do is to figure out how can I help him in a way that advances my passion. I'll give you a great example. Years ago, lead pastors love vision and mission and direction. They love all that stuff, right? And years ago, I was at a church where our pastor and the elders, they went through this whole process of redoing all the core values and the mission statement and the vision of the church. And, and they landed on this statement. And they love these statements, right? And the statement was that our church, I'm not going to say the name of the church, but our church exists to equip believers to impact the world, all right? Equipping believers to impact the world. And, and I liked it. And so they divided every ministry into the church. It was either an equipping ministry or an impacting ministry. Isn't that cool? So adult Bibles fellowships were equipping. Missions was uh, impacting. There was home missions and world missions. Um, every ministry, in fact, they ended up hiring an equipping pastor and an impact pastor. And that was how my pastor wanted to structure everything in the church. Everything. I mean, everything fell under equipping and impacting. Well, I was struggling with VBS and wanting to do something fresh and new. Not criticizing VBS. All the VBS lovers don't don't send me emails, hate mails. Um, but I was wrestling with doing something new and something creative. And our team was wrestling, but VBS was in my job description. So I was like, well, how do I not do a VBS and do something creative? Well, when my pastor came up with equipping believers to impact the world, I went to my boss and I said, I love your vision. I love this new mission. I would like to embrace it. I'd like my team to equip families and volunteers to uh, impact their neighborhoods for Christ. So instead of VBS, can I equip families to host an event at their home? And we started Backyard Bible Blast so that, and anyway, I won't take a lot of time. But when I, when I pitched what I wanted to do in the context of his vision, he loved it. We got a trailer, we equipped it, we built teams, and we did these Backyard Bible Blasts. And the next summer, Backyard Bible Splash, it was a water theme. We did these all over the community. We reached more kids for Christ, and then we had fall outreach events, and it was fabulous. But he bought into it because I was helping his vision come true, not just going to him and saying, hey, here's something different um, that I want to do. Support the leadership above you. I'll cruise faster on the next two. The second one is over communicate with the leadership above you. Man, I always hear uh, children's pastors whining and complaining about how they're the best kept secret in the church, how nobody knows, you know, all that we do. Well, I have a very simple answer for that. Whose fault is that? Hmm? Whose fault is that? If nobody knows what's going on in the kids' ministry, that's your fault. Uh, you know, maybe you need to gossip. Okay, not gossip, but you know what I'm saying. If nobody knows, then you need to start communicating it. In fact, if you go to my Facebook page today, um, well, by the time this gets live, it'll be a couple days ago or maybe months ago, whenever you watch this. I make highlight videos all the time, all right? There's an app called Quick, Q-U-I-K, that's free in the app store. It's from the GoPro. You throw in pictures and video and boom, you have a video. You can go to animoto.com and throw together great videos. Most of your phones do it automatically. Man, I just made a highlight video from yesterday because I want everyone to see how amazing Kids Church was yesterday. You don't just make marketing videos to promote what's coming. You make videos afterward. You post pictures. I have volunteers that take great pictures every Sunday 
and I put them on Facebook and Instagram. I want everyone to know how amazing our children's ministry is. I celebrate our volunteers. Don't be the best kept secret. Make sure everyone knows what's going on in your kids' ministry, all right? So you advance plan, you program, make sure your boss knows what's going on. You give them flyers, you copy them on emails, and you can tell. I don't expect you to read all this. I just want you to have access and at your fingertips what's going on in the kids' ministry. All right, talk to them about it. Share stories with them. Take them out to, to coffee or out to eat or and share these things with them. If you make a cool YouTube video, text it to them with a short explanation about um, what it is. Share what could be. Share what your needs are. Share what your dreams are. Share what your challenges are. Asking help. Over communicate with the leadership above you. You can create monthly reports or newsletters or whatever to make sure that the leadership above you knows what's going on, knows what your dreams are, knows what your prayer requests are. Here's the great stories of what's going on in your children's ministry. Don't let the kids' ministry be the best kept secret. Make sure everyone knows. Number three, champion the children's ministry. Don't expect anyone else to do it. Remember, don't expect more of the leadership above you. That's why you are there. You are there to champion the kids' ministry. You are there to sing the praises of the volunteers. You are there to tell the stories of the kids. Make sure people understand your philosophy of ministry. See if your pastor will give you opportunities at a board meeting, at a congregational meeting, even on a Sunday morning to explain your children's ministry. I'll link in the video. My pastor had a conversation with me last fall, and it was six things every children's pastor wishes parents understood about children's ministry. I was so thankful for that. I got to preach a while ago, and I know not everyone gets that opportunity. There's been churches where I never got to enjoy the platform. I'm thankful that here I get to. And I walked up and I said, um, uh, children are the church of tomorrow. I'm uh, have you heard it said, children of a church of tomorrow? And I got a bunch of amens. And I said, well, I'm here to tell you that's not true. <gasps> Everyone was shocked. I said, children of the church of today. And I got to lay out my philosophy of ministry. You know, I'm always in costumes. I'm always doing funny things. And I love when people say, man, Carl, you have a serious side. I didn't realize you're such a serious guy when it comes to children's ministry. Because I love explaining the serious side of why I do what I do, why I dress up, why I do costumes, why we do themes. And when people get the philosophy behind why I do kids ministry the way I do, why I sign because Jesus loves children above my signature, um, it, it, it helps in recruiting, it helps in resourcing, it helps in getting resources and supplies donated because people start to get it. So you need to celebrate wins. You need to share the spotlight. When you get attention for the kids' ministry, take that spotlight while it's on you and grab it and turn it toward volunteers, turn it toward others who have made it possible and market, market, market. Become a master of email marketing and Instagram and Facebook and, and just letting people know everything that is going on. And make your theme verse Romans 12, 9. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. All right? There is so much opportunity that we have to serve the Lord in our children's ministry, and we need to keep at it. Don't let the leadership above you discourage you. Pray for your leaders and communicate with them. Serve them. It may be that you need to make it your goal to see what can I do to serve the leadership above me. How can I improve my communication with them? What do I need to do to champion the leadership above me? How can I pray for them? And if you do that faithfully and consistently, you will see improvement in the months and the years ahead. So thanks for hanging out with me. Watch the show notes, and I'll put a bunch of links and stuff in there. But keep on at it. Don't give up. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor receiving the Lord. Remember, if you don't give up, you will receive a reward.